The letter from um, the epistles comes from Romans in the eighth chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. I read from the New Jerusalem Bible. All who are guided by the Spirit of God are children of God. For what you received was not the spirit of slavery to bring you back into fear. You received the spirit of adoption, enabling us to cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit joins with our spirit to bear witness that we are the children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, provided that we share Christ's suffering so as to share Christ's glory. And now moving to the 22nd verse. We are well aware that the whole creation until this time has been groaning in labor pains. Not only that, we too have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we are groaning inside ourselves, waiting with eagerness for our bodies to be set free. In hope, we already have salvation. In hope, not visibly present, or we should not be hoping. Nobody goes on hoping for something which that person can already see. But having this hope for what we cannot yet see, we are able to wait for it with persevering confidence. As well as this, the Spirit too comes to help us in our weakness. For when we do not know how to pray properly, then the Spirit personally makes our petitions for us in groans that cannot be put into words. And the Spirit and God who sees into all hearts knows what the Spirit means because the prayers that the Spirit makes for God's holy people are always according to the longing of God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? God, our beloved, send your spirit to our ears and our hearts. Make all that is not your truth quickly fade away, and all that is your truth take root in our hearts and flourish. We ask for this grace in your holy name. Amen. to make a parenthetical remark before I begin, in to, uh, begin the sermon in, um, in full force, because I'm realizing that I've used an image in the sermon that you may not be familiar with. Um, when you get a ring on your finger that's too tight, at our house we do two things. We hold it up in the air so the blood drains, and we put soap on it, and often the ring slips right off. So you'll be hearing the imagery of using soap as a lubricant so something can move more easily. If you weren't aware of that, that's what I'm talking about. So now, I invite you to imagine yourself having a meal with good friends. An engaging conversation might range from a guest's recent business trip to New Zealand to a newly discovered hole-in-the-wall restaurant that serves fabulous fresh seafood. There might be talk about the misadventures and triumphs of the kids or a gorgeous bike trail in Van Buren County. Social and political events might provide grist for the mill, or maybe even conversation about tough decisions that are being faced or what the future might hold. And sometimes, especially if the guests are not family, religion might be discussed. You know what I mean. (laughs) But there's one taboo topic, it seems 
even in our supposedly very open society, it is still considered in poor taste to talk about money. Generally, people guard their salaries, their benefits, and perks like state secrets. My European-born father believed that it was both gauche and an affront to God for Christians to show any indication of wealth, much less flaunt it. That money was a God-given resource to be used for the needs of others, not to indulge its stewards. I would guess that when most people speak of their debt or their financial reversals and their money worries, they do so only in the company of a most trusted confidant from whom they expect no judgment. Isn't that interesting? Such guardedness, so many unspoken rules about money. One would not expect that from people in the Judeo-Christian heritage. Our scriptures and the uses and misuses of money uh, address the uses and misuses of money more frequently than any other topic. So what are the taboos all about? I'm wondering if that's chasing the wrong rabbit. I'm wondering about the possibility of today's gospel story that seems to be about money isn't really about money at all. Instead, I'm wondering if money is a symbol for anything that stands between us and God. Let's think for a moment about what money symbolizes in our culture. We Americans are often very fond of the bootstrap stories, whether one has boots or not. We like to think of someone who has gone from rags to riches as a person who has gumption and ingenuity and stick to that she or he is bright and hardworking and persevering. And sometimes that is 100% true. Oddly, we don't usually attribute those same traits to the illiterate woman whose day begins at 4 a.m. in a hot hospital laundry, scrubbing soil sheets and towels in order to feed her children. Money buys privilege. In the minds of many, money buys protection against life's vagaries. Chances are good that people privileged by race or circumstances of birth, by intellect, station in life, money itself, or a thousand other privileges are people who seem to be able to take care of their own needs. However, I'm wondering if this gospel story asks whether the same privilege also puts us in danger of creating a world in which we are insulated from the transformative experiences that usher us through the eye of the needle into the presence and activity of God. Not long ago, a friend's daughter went abroad to study and work in what seemed like a God-forsaken and poverty-stricken country. It was quite a shock. The young woman had grown up in a very secure world, in a solid, hardworking, devoutly religious Midwestern family. They lived in a lovely home. They had enough resources for good food, stylish enough clothes, adventurous vacations, and good schools. She was very certain of herself certain of her solidly middle-class American values and her view of how the world works. She knew right from wrong and exactly how things ought to be. Living in a very different world without the comforts and securities that most of us think of as essential turned out for her to be a transformative experience. Her experience pushed the young woman, and a very nice camel indeed she was, through the eye of the needle. It was like being born again. It opened her eyes and gave her deep compassion for the suffering of the poor, their victimization sometimes by corporations and corrupt governments, their hunger 
their real literal hunger, their sickness, and the abject poverty of their living conditions. Her innocent smugness, honestly, just the effect of youth and limited exposure, not mean-spiritedness, had been stripped away. When the young woman came back to the States, it was not unusual for her to respond to a common everyday American complaint with, that's a first world problem, Mom. Hmm. In her case, I wonder if the protection of class privilege and capacity was the money the scriptures speak of. When we put our trust in our ability to handle our own lives, when we don't really need anybody because we've got it covered, when we expect to be safe wherever we go and whatever we do, when there's nothing we can't figure out because we're so smart and capable, and when we're able to buy pretty much whatever we need, is that our money? And if so, then we are like the young man that Jesus loved who just couldn't let go of what he trusted most. To be very clear, I'm not saying that taking care of the business of our lives isn't a good thing. Yes, it is. But I am wondering if our capacities make us feel as if we are without limitations, that there is nothing or no one we trust more than our own resources. Then, if that's true, what happens when we come face to face with our limitations? What happens when those limits force a change regarding where we put our ultimate trust? In our, in our, in our capacities that seem to be limited or in God? Maybe the man in the story had not yet faced limitations that his resources could not handle. He'd gained a good education. He'd followed all the rules. Clearly, he earnestly wanted more. He wanted to go through the eye of the needle, but he just couldn't let go of what he trusted most. Most of us hold on to whatever we trust most until life yanks it out of our hands. Now, just a month from retirement, I've been reflecting on the years of my ministry, thinking about what it's all been about. There are lots of ways to understand ministry, but this text and several good friends' insights have brought me to frame ministry as the work of standing with others when what we normally trust is yanked out of our hands. Ministry for both pastors and congregations is facing human limitation. From the cradle to the grave, bearing witness to the way and the trustworthiness of God. It's lovely, it's fun to be called to the hospital to welcome and perhaps cuddle and hopefully anoint a new baby. That's the hallmark side of birth. But in just a few months, Seth or I will stand there at the font and cradle that same child in our arms and announce to all who will hear that in baptism, that gorgeous newborn is intended to die with Christ, meaning to face ultimate limitation, to move through the eye of the needle in order to live with Christ and so inherit eternal life. I, as a minister, take on particular kinds of ministry in the vows of ordination. You assume your ministries when you take those baptismal vows, when you volunteer for nursery, when you pay for curriculum. You learn those children's names, you pray for them, and you never, ever forget wherever you are in whatever you're doing that who you are teaches those children far more about being followers of Christ than any curriculum ever could. For those of us who were here a few years ago, 
we will never forget the death of Dylan Pet Petrick. In the morning, he was a happy baby with that duck fuzz hair that floats in a little breeze. By afternoon, he was dead, a horrific, unexplainable, heart-rending tragedy. Seth and I were sitting beside each other in a meeting when Ann Johnson called Seth on his cell phone. In the long sorrow that followed, we walked beside Beth and Adam and Braden, unable to change their circumstances. We could not fill the emptiness. We could not erase the sorrow. We could not explain human finitude. You ministered when you came to the funeral, you sent cards, you dropped off casseroles, you offered care for little Braden, you prayed and you carried the sorrow, perhaps still in your memory. When we baptized their newborn daughter last fall, maybe you wept with me, remembering baptizing her brothers and knowing the family had faced the fiercest limitation in death. When the beloved of God who sit beside you in the pew now or live down the street face the circumstances that slam us into our limitation, the ministry of the church is to acknowledge the suffering, to do what we can, to pray and lather our brothers and sisters with the soap of love to help ease them through the eye of the needle. When we face suicide and dementia, accidents and mental illness, financial ruin, abuse, devastating illness, and a marriage falling apart, even death, and believe me, it all happens here. Then the church, often first in the person of the pastor and then in your persons, stands with us and before God. The faith community holds our places until we return and tells us you have not been forgotten. The faith community does what it can. We pray, we do laundry, we pick up for a few months' rent, we help find therapists and doctors and good AA groups. We show up at funerals. We listen. We comfort, we stand with and beside while our sisters and brothers and we ourselves decide yet again where to put our ultimate trust. When we face those limitations, we also ask the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And remember, in the gospel, eternal life does not mean heaven. It means as Jesus described it, a full, rich, abundant life filled with God and in God's way. These are the times when we stand at the eye of the needle. Jesus looks at us with compassion and loves us and tells us what to do. We have to decide whether to hold on to our riches, whatever those might be, or to let go of whatever we trust more than God. And if we do decide to let go, we're freed to go through the eye of the needle, claiming what is waiting for us as sons and daughters of God. I trust you see how this very earthbound spiritual process described in the gospel story is both individual and communal. Life does happen to us as individuals, but it also happens to us as a community. If we behave as the church is intended to behave, we help one another lay down the riches that get in the way of inheriting eternal life. Learning to trust one another is part of shifting our trust from ourselves and whatever riches we trust to our faith community and then to God. Like everything else, we don't do it perfectly. I never fail to be amazed at the things that I can say or do that will be hurtful to someone, but we do it. Sometimes those we trust fail us, this, too, is an eye to pass through and then to discover that, unlike mortals, God never fails us.
I learned this very clearly from my first pastorate. On January 24, 1980, Ben and I struck out for upstate New York, scared to death, but excited about our new beginnings. We were headed for our new home and my first parish. Ben drove our U-Haul trucks stuffed with, of all things, books, and a few pieces of hand-me-down furniture and a college dorm bookcase, which, in my world, amounted to eight bricks and a board. I followed in our ultra-cool tomato red Ford Pinto. My, color, my cargo was our most fragile wedding gifts and our much-beloved plants. We had love, we had dreams, and maybe 50 bucks. Surely not a dime more. I was nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. I was the first woman to serve a parish alone in my denomination. I knew the congregation didn't want me, but I was willing, and so they took me. I had no idea what to expect, and nor did the people in the church. When Ben and I arrived <clears throat> in Albany on a bitterly cold but gorgeous morning on January 26th, we were greeted with a message that my dad had died the day before. It wasn't okay then, but it's okay now. Remember, I'm the child of his frivolous old age. He was 85 and had lived a long, full life. He had not been ill, his heart just stopped beating. Now, having lasted for 300 years or more, old ch churches in upstate New York have um, generous and community ways of doing things. Ministers trade privacy and autonomy for how they do things. The women had scrubbed the parsonage and had had a pound party filling the pantry and the fridge with a pound of flour, a pound of butter, a loaf of bread, a jar of applesauce, and on and on. What a beautiful, beautiful gift for people who've moved halfway across the country to fill the pantry. The men appeared out of nowhere to unload our truck, thinking it was going to be a big job. 30 minutes, all done. The patriarch, who had only months before gone from house to house asking, and why not a woman pastor, now went from parlor to parlor with hat in hand. Within hours, he had gathered enough money to fly Ben and me back to Michigan for my dad's funeral. As it turned out, that sad beginning became a gift. Neither the church nor I had any idea what was before us, but they understood death. They circled the wagons around their new young minister and passed the tissues. I was no longer an issue to fight over. I was a young woman whose dad had died. I wasn't just the giver. I needed them perhaps more than I knew. They taught me again to trust community even uncertain, imperfect, mad-at-you community. Now, near the end of my professional ministry, I stand beside my mom as she faces her ultimate limitation, and I face still another of my own limitations. Already, I feel you lathering me with soap so as to ease my way through the eye of the needle again. This, it seems, is how eternal life comes to us. By loosening our grip on that which we trust more than God, our very clever brains, our physical strength, sometimes our health, our money, family ties, sometimes even our presence of mind, our pride, our appearance, letting go of what cannot be ultimately trusted, we can pass through the eye of the needle to God, whom we trust without limitation. When you think about it, we're all of us the man who came to Jesus. 
we're all asking what we must do to inherit eternal life or we wouldn't be here this morning. Some of us have followed the rules and done the right thing or at least done the right thing more often than the wrong thing. But that's not really what inheriting eternal life is. Jesus, moved by our desire, our fears of letting go of what we trust, Jesus looks at us with compassion and loves us too. But we have to make the decision over and over again, sometimes several times a day, to trust that love. We all have to decide time and time again whether to divest our frightened hearts of whatever our riches may be and trust God ultimately. Should we opt to trust in God? This is the witness to God's trustworthiness. There is nothing in death or in life in the world as it is or the world as it shall be, in the forces of the universe, in height or depth, nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for this life-giving word. Amen.